Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It's Thursday, December 5th, 2019. I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the sixth. What is it the sixth time award winning majority report? Is that some riff Sam was going on the other day? Probably even more, but I can't change it. Who's counting? Yeah. Silver subscriber button owning the many, many, many times award winning majority report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Ronan Burton Shaw, editor of the Tribune. We're talking about whether or not the UK will save itself and vote for a Labour Party government. What are the prospects of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald? The next wave of decimation plans by Boris Johnson and the Tories and the absolute right wing fraudulence of the Lib Dems. Also, how this election fits into the global context. Trump administration, you know, the isolationist and endless war ones. Well, they're considering deploying uh, 14,000 additional troops in the Middle East. Hmm. Interesting. Giuliani faces scrutiny <laughs> over his dealings with the Ukrainians. Nancy Pelosi suggests there is no choice but impeachment, but her approach is wonky, funky. Moderate Dems warn against a kitchen sink impeachment push, even as this is already happening, folks. Warren and Biden lose ground. Sanders picks up significant ground in California days after Harris is out. Republicans face backlash, uh, according to modest headlines, and Uh, Her challenger is banned from Twitter for calling for Ilan Omar to be hanged as the incitement and lying and terrorism campaign continues against her. Also, the global campaign. Yeah, there's global campaign. Seems like there's some Israeli propaganda going on against Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. What a shock that is. D.C. with the most absurd invite of the week. Wells Fargo is sponsoring an affordable housing panel. Huh. Pete Buttigieg's work at McKinsey is secret. Hillary Clinton is absolutely delusional, but she probably should have had Howard Stern interview her earlier. Uh, and political prisoner, former political prisoner and former Brazilian president Lula da Silva is free organizing to save Brazilian democracy. Why is it that a infamous U.S. diplomat was just meeting with an appeals court of biased judges that just reaffirmed his sentence? Hmm. That's a bit odd. Glenn Greenwald's interview with Deposed Bolivian leader set to drop soon as the Bolivian coup regime. Um, new video evidence emerges of yet more right wing death squad activity. All that and much, much more on today's majority report. We are here, obviously, except without Sam. Um, my understanding is that he is home reading bra ads, uh, drinking some lemon water, and looking up uh, Wikipedia articles of law professors. So he is getting recharged and renewed. um, And of course, we'll be here in full force Friday. Yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Fred Hampton. Um, 
who was assassinated and, and monitored by the U.S. surveillance state. Uh, Ken Klippenstein recently reported how the FBI still monitors so-called black identity extremists. Now, two quick points. One, I don't want the FBI uh, monitoring anyone, regardless of how odious their belief is. Uh, they can be saying and talking about and whatever. I'm a civil libertarian in that sense. I only want them limited, uh, monitoring people that might actually commit a terrorist attack. Whatever you know, ideology they're, they're representing, kill innocent people. And number two, that's the major point. But to be really clear, they're not doing some false, ridiculous equivalency like, oh, we're monitoring the Klan, but we're also monitoring, you know, some random sect that says they hate white people or whatever. Also would be, you know, ridiculous in, in, in all senses, in the civil libertarian sense that I mentioned first. But they're def uh, defining black identity extremists essentially as people fighting against police brutality for criminal justice reform and against violence uh, in all different communities uh, across the nation, where this is a serious and systemic problem, as we all know. So uh, I want everybody to know that Fred Hampton is both not history in the sense that his analysis is relevant to today and his in insight is relevant today, and the same forces that assassinated him are empowered today. This depends on the education. System. Well, the whole thing. Right? No, but it means this does. You, you can form this with no education. You can uh, form this and this. No, not the way we're talking about forming it. You know, right. We're talking about forming it right. You know, it's not on the paper. We didn't write it on no, the paper. Form it right with no education. No. Let me give you an example. Uh, you, you, your Mo Kenyatta formed the excellent revolution with no education. And on the day of the end thing, your mother told the motherfucker, I said, well, uh, you know, you've been educated to uh, uh, hate the enemy, but uh, I'm your brother, I'll help you lead the revolution, now I'm more pressure. Another example, Papa Doc in Haiti. Papa Doc in Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put this white paper in front of Papa Doc's face, Seeing but he moved all the white people out and he took over to be the president. He did, causing no education. And the people that had been educated, they just said that we don't hate the motherfucking uh, white people, we hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. So we got to know the education program to find out what is going to be in the finale. A lot of people, what, your Mo Kenyatta is called not a never a revolutionary, but an ex-revolutionary. So it's Papa Doc. They brought on a successful revolution. That thing in uh, the Mau Mau's was a bitch. Bantu freedom fighters, all that kind of action. But what we're saying is, that it's the end. But you don't judge Castro now. You can't do it. Nobody in this room could judge whether Castro's going to be a revolutionary or not. Uh, you know what I mean? We're talking about things, you know what I mean, uh, with uh, China, the People's Republic, and even at the stage they're in now, talking about even going on further into a communistic state. That's what we're talking about. Those are revolutionary. So we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people that take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's the people's thing anyway. You understand what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism like you got in uh, Africa 9, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be an uh, educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they know where. You dig what I'm saying? They know where, because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, you might get people caught up in the emotionalist movement. Uh, you understand me? You might be, get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be capitalists. And before you know it, we have Negro imperialists. Well, uh, that of, of course, that's you know that reflects, again, Adolf Reed's indispensable work and... Walter Rodney and Milton Alamadi and other people who've done the kind of uh, the neo-colonialist critiques. And I mean, look, this is, but this is also in the context where he's generating and building some of the most important political alliances in the context of his time across racial and economic boundaries in a Marxist and liberatory framework. And he's also getting uh, spied on, surveilled, terrorized, and eventually assassinated. And he's only in his early 20s. Yeah, that's a crazy thing. Whenever you hear him talk, break things down like that, yes. he's 20. I don't know. I, I couldn't break down any subject matter at age 20 like that. No. Yeah, it, it's interesting that they refer to him as a black identity extremist because that's really a minimization of what he was and what he was about. Because 
he understood you cannot take on white supremacy without taking on capitalism too. And he was uniting workers of all races in a project that was very subversive and threatening to the status quo. Um, Can I read a quote from Fred Hampton? Please. This is a good one. He said, we got to face some facts that the masses are poor, that the masses belong to what you call the lower class. And when I talk about the masses, I'm talking about the white masses. I'm talking about the black masses and the brown masses and the yellow masses too. We've got to face the fact that some people say you fight fire best with fire, but we say you put fire out best with water. We say you don't fight racism with racism. We're going to fight racism with solidarity. We say you don't fight capitalism with black capitalism. You fight capitalism with socialism. Mm. And that goes to the heart of so much of what we're always talking about on this show, I think. And like kind of hits at this like zero sum game argument that we're always having with Sam. But Fred, it's a zero sum game. Um, that would be quite a debate. Uh, with the cold months approaching, nothing sounds better than curling up next to a warm fire, sipping a cup of hot cocoa and cracking open an intricate homicide investigation. Q hunt a killer. The subscription box game, the subscription game that thrusts you and your friends and family into an ongoing murder mystery investigation with every delivery You'll sift through piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files, eliminating suspects until you solve the case and catch the killer. No wonder they have 2,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot. 2,000 five-star. That's actually a lot. Um, Sam's playing it with his, uh, his fam. He raves about it, not only on air, but in the office. He talks about how fun it is to have something that is off technology, that's not on the phone, that's not on the computer, that is actually really interesting, that's like brain work. And then also, you know, it's like- Makes his kids pay attention to him. Makes his kids pay attention to him. It's It's related. It's like the TV, but it's not the TV at all because it's engaged. He goes on and on and on. And it sounds incredibly fun. I actually think we should do we should basically do the thing in the office. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com and use promo code MAJORITY to get 20% off your first box. They even have a gift card for all of your holiday shopping. Not to mention they're throwing in exclusive bundles for the holiday season. So make sure to use promo code MAJORITY at huntakiller.com for a 20% discount and show your support for the show. That's huntakiller.com. Promo code ma. Majority. The problem that keeps so many businesses from knowing their numbers is a hodgepodge of business systems. They have one system for accounting, another for sales, another for inventory and so on. It's just a big inefficient mess and it takes up way too much time and too many resources and that hurts the bottom line. That is 100% true, particularly if you're running a small business and not only do you not, I mean, of course you don't want resources wasted but you also need to fight for your time you need to fight to not have every second of your day eaten up by redundant logistics so you can deliver actual good work great work um, and have a life introducing NetSuite by Oracle the business management software that handles every aspect of your business an easy to use cloud platform that gives you visibility, gives you the visibility and control you need to grow with NetSuite. You save time, money, and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance, and accounting orders and HR instantly right from your desktop or phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud system, cloud business system. And right now NetSuite is offering you Valuable insights with a free guide, seven key strategies to grow profits at netsuite.com slash majority. That's netsuite.com slash majority to download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits, netsuite.com slash majority. And finally, there has been a significant visual upgrade in the office. And of course, I'm talking about Sam's footwear. Kara Yuma marries old school designs and new school ethics for sneakers that are good looking, crazy comfy, and consciously made. With an obsessive eye for detail, they make their sneakers by hand with premium natural materials, including cotton sourced from fair trade initiatives. They also 
make their outsole using raw natural rubbers and ensure that factory workers earn their wages and experience safe working conditions, earn fair wages and experience safe working conditions. These are important things and they can't, and they don't, and they don't, and they just don't, sorry, these are important things and they just don't compromise. Even their packaging is made from recycled and 100% recyclable materials. Plus they make up carbon emissions released during transportation by purchasing carbon offsets, creating a shipping footprint at a balance of zero. Best of all, their brand new IRI sneakers is knit from self-generating bamboo and recycled plastics from heel to toe. I experience looking at the first piece of footwear that Sam has ever worn that I think I will buy myself. Wow. <laughs> That's a ringing endorsement. That is revolutionary. <laughs> Previous grade for Sam's footwear was, whoo, or okay. Now it's like, damn, those look really, really good. And it's awesome how ecologically sustainable they are. I want a pair. I was stunned. For a limited time, uh, for a limited time, our listeners can get fifteen percent off of your first pair of Karayuma sneakers. They ship worldwide, and they offer express shipping in the USA. Plus, if for any reason they don't fit perfectly, you can return them free of charge. That is so. That's awesome. So go to c a r i u m a dot com slash majority to get fifteen percent off. That's c a r i u m a dot com slash majority for 15 percent off we're going to take a brief break folks and we are going to come back with ronan burton shaw to talk about whether the uk will avert tory catastrophe
Welcome back to the Majority Report. Just had actually some uh, really nice conversation with our friend in Dublin. Thank you so much uh, for setting that up. I don't know if I should I should uh, say uh, uh, the name, but I appreciate you. Uh, and now joining us uh, is our friend Ronan Burton Shaw. He's the editor of Tribune Magazine. Ronan, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. Sorry about that confusion at the start. How's things? Things are good. Very happy to be talking with you. So take us, you know, I've been following this UK election quite a bit. Uh, I think the stakes, obviously, I mean, I think really things like the NHS are obviously the very nature of um, uh, the basic social infrastructure of the United Kingdom are at, uh, are at stake here. Um, what are the main forces though for people who maybe haven't been paying as much attention can you give us a run through of the tories of labor of the lib dems any other relevant parties and also um you know the bigger ideological questions but you know a lot of questions people have about you know tactical voting how the system actually works uh these types of things just ground us in the 2019 uk general election yeah, so the, the system over here is a first-past-the-post system, right? So uh, that's uh, the first and most important thing to um, to kind of lay out there, which means that tactical voting in a certain number of cases uh, is something that you see quite a bit um, uh, during elections, but only in very specific areas. So we don't have that's what a lot of European systems have, which is single transferable vote or proportional representation, which means votes can be transferred so on. It literally is the candidate that gets over first. In that way, it's pretty similar to the American system. And so where, for instance, you have a candidate who's a Tory MP in the a Labour MP, uh, then be trying to convince voters of other that um, screens or whatever to vote for that Labour MP. And similarly enough, if you have um, a Tory MP and the nearest is Liberal Democrat, well, then you do have sites that are arguing for uh, for voting that way. But it is pretty important to lay out that uh, it's difficult to know with the polling landscape at the moment where seats, individual seats are going. Because last time in 2017, the scale of Labour's comeback in the final weeks of that campaign meant that the party won a lot of seats that quite simply had never even been considered Labour territory beforehand. Places like Canterbury where um, the Tories were safe not only for you know decades but going back in you know centuries in in, in the vote. So uh, you know those tactical voting sites and that kind of discussion, I think, is something you have to be relatively uh, skeptical of, particularly because the Liberal Democrat vote is on the decline, the Labour vote is on the uh, is on the up. Uh, Sorry, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, Ronan, we can hear you. I mean, it's it, honestly, I mean, it's a little bit of a funky connection. I don't know if we have an alternative, but I, we can hear you if this if this needs to be it, it works. Um, tell us then about the stakes of the election and the what the really, I mean, on the positive end, the incredible things that Labor is putting on the table. I mean, they put out a really great manifesto, uh, and then the danger of the Tories, but I think it's also really important to talk about how Dominique Cummings, who's uh, Boris Johnson's main strategist and the kind of architect and the architect of the Brexit campaign, how they are definitely part of this, you know, this populist right that certainly understands that, that, that they should be lying about austerity, which they are. And then also, um, you know, the Lib Dems and really just, yeah, they're wreckers and they're partners in destroying the UK, if I might editorialize. Sure. I think people need to be really clear about sure. that. Yeah, well, look, the battle that's going on in Britain now is a very specific one. It is a battle along class lines. Um, so whereas previously uh, in the kind of 2000s and the new Labour era, um, you had a Labour Party that was very centre-left, moderate, Pro corporate interests and so forth, um, they did things like bring up private financing into the NHS. And now, under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, you've got a solidly left wing Labour Party, a, left, a Labour Party which is standing on a platform of increasing minimum wage, 
scrapping anti-union laws, introducing a Green New Deal, uh, properly uh, renationalizing and kicking out the, the private interest from the NHS, increasing funding for education, um, ending some of the really miserable welfare policies over here, like universal credit, which are pushing thousands and thousands of people into poverty, uh, building a million council houses over a 10-year period. So the Labour Party now has an ambitious socialist manifesto and platform led by people and Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell and Diane Abbott, who are lifelong socialists, people who uh, were socialists when it was not, you know, to be frank, so trendy as it maybe is for this generation right. um, to be socialists. They were socialists when, when it really meant that they were on the complete fringes. They were MPs in a group of five and six and seven who were totally outside of any question of power. They laughed at and mocked by the media, basically, for their criticisms of capitalism. Uh, and now they lead a major party, one of the most significant parties um, in the Western world, if you think of its longevity, if you think of its size, of its membership, we about a half a million members, if you think of the historic role that the Labour Party has played in upholding uh, capitalism in Britain, uh, and obviously Britain having been one of the uh, historic uh, powers uh, on, on, the, on the world stage uh, and maintaining the capitalist system. So we have a an incredibly um, radical, uh, in one sense, uh, when you look at it through history and so forth, uh, proposition here, which is that we we have a real socialist elected to 10 Downing Street. And on the other side, we have a radicalizing Tory party. Uh, so this is not, you know, the Tory party of David Cameron either. All of these kind of old um, coordinates are really being thrashed in this era. A bit like in the United States, you know, where, where you, it, this is no longer the kind of uh, longed for moderate Republican Party of the New York Times columnists and whatever. And now you've got the Republican Party of Donald Trump, where the mask is kind of ripped off and the reality of their politics are exposed. And it's it's quite similar with uh, with uh, Boris Johnson. He's running a hard Brexit Tory party on a platform which is... Um, basically to exit the European Union, but do it in a specific way, which tears up rights and protections, tears up workers' rights, health and safety, so on, does a free trade agreement with the United States, opens up the National Health Service and God knows what other parts of the public sector to private and international investment, um, puts a, a kind of, a, it's a kind of Margaret Thatcher on steroids program. Um, and he's doing all this also as a figure who has you know, consistently been a provocateur for a racist right-wing politics. Um, somebody who, when he was a columnist, made his life out of being one of those people who deliberately tried to annoy um, liberal opinion, uh, who, who you know, said things like Muslim women uh, looked like letterboxes when they were burqas, um, called black people pickaninnies, yep. um, made all kinds of derogatory comments about uh, single mothers, which we were just discussing this week, and how their children are more, you know, propensity to violence and all the rest of it. Um, so this is a guy who, you know, I don't think in America you would find it that hard to imagine those kind of figures, right? right. You know who they are. Well, one of them is yeah. the Prime Minister here, and he's, lead, he's leading this Conservative Party in this election, and it's him against Jeremy Corbyn. As you said, there is a third force, um, the Lib Dems. There's also the question of Scotland and the SNP and so on, we'll maybe come to in a minute. But the, the third force, the Liberal Democrats, um, who you know were doing very well for a period coming up to this election because basically they had the backing of Liberal business interests. Um, they positioned themselves entirely around the Brexit question. There were these big lobby groups like the People's Vote who were pushing all the time that what had to happen with Brexit is the whole thing had to be overturned. We had to have the you know, a new referendum. And actually the Dems went so far as saying just we will revoke the vote altogether uh, in this election. Um, and they did that partly because what they want a you know a left option on the table or an option that you know people who who are who don't like you know Boris Johnson or Donald Trump style politics can vote for, which doesn't imply challenging corporate power, redistributing wealth, rebuilding a welfare state, giving you know power to workers, because the Lib Dems of course were the coalition partners of the Conservatives between 2010 and 2015, during the period when the very worst austerity that was imposed in Britain was brought in, and they signed off on all of it. Um, so they're, they're kind of a party that represents, yeah, the, the, the kind of uh, 
liberal business interests, people who are very concerned about um, people being respectful in their political discourse and don't like the idea of a boorish Boris Johnson, um, but also don't want to solve any of the kind of underlying social problems that lead to the creation and the rise of figures like Boris Johnson in the first place. And also... Just to really underline, because I've been noticing, I mean, it's so funny, I get the same kind of neurotic concern trolling now from people in the UK when I talk about the Lib Dems. And, you know, if if I had confidence that there was some, you know, uh, discredited trash centrist party, but they were going to coalition with uh, Labour... Uh, and they had made that commitment and so on, I might be more uh, open to it. But my uh, to to the so-called tactical question voting, uh, tactical voting question, which you've already actually discredited and runs against the evidence we have of the labor resurgence of 2017, which might definitely repeat itself here. But they've said quite explicitly themselves um, that they are not going to support a Corbyn government. They will not team with labor. They're absolutely committed to the same austerity program that, you know, uh, caused so much devastation and havoc the last time they had power. So, I, I mean, you know, as you, I, I think you've said it, I mean, I guess if you're a Tory who's, you know, far right wing, but doesn't feel so comfortable with like overt racism, that's your vote. But if you're anybody else and you're concerned about something like saving the NHS or dealing with the roots of the resurgence of far right populism, I mean, the Lib Dems are sort of like the classic case study of what facilitated the crisis we're in. I would agree. I mean, my own my own view of it is uh, I've done quite a bit uh, of door knocking for labor in this election. It's actually where it just was before this call. And, you know, you run into people who um, are well-meaning who are voting Lib Dem. They're people who kind of, you know, the whole conversation, the media has been so focused on Brexit for so long, mm -hmm. to the exclusion of every other problem, that people have been to some degree blinded about what the Lib Dem's record really is. And you're speaking to a person on the door and you're like, well, you know, do you support all of these austerity policies that the Lib Dems are responsible for? Do you think we should be funding the NHS? Do you believe there should be a higher minimum wage? Are you a fan of, for instance, one of the things the Lib Dems did notoriously when they were in government, which was that they massively increased the fees workers had to pay to go to employment tribunals if they were unfairly sacked? I mean, are you a fan of that kind of stuff? And people are not. And they said, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that because there wasn't being put forward. The critical line about, you know, what the Lib Dems had done before wasn't being put forward. And I have to be honest, I think it's part of a very serious structural problem in the British media which is that uh, a lot of British journalists, particularly editors and the people who own the big newspapers, they really don't want Corbyn's arguments to be on the pitch. They want it to be a culture war battle between, you know, uh, people with nice liberal social views, people with conservative social views, and the economic question can be basically written off. Uh, and that is why the Liberal Democrats will always be their preferred kind of non-Tory option. That's why they'll always uh, push their kind of uh, their uh, policies, their politics, um, instead of the Labour Party in its current form. Uh, because once you get to a point where people are actually asked the economic questions, another big thing that I haven't even mentioned about Labour's platform yet is renationalization, right? So let neighbor, Labour are proposing to renationalize rail, mail, energy, water. These are things that, if you look at the polls, there is overwhelming support. These things have 70, 80 percent support in the polls, time after time after time. And there is a huge consensus behind the need for economic change, the ending of privatization, some serious action about economic inequality and regional inequality in Britain. But the media doesn't want to talk about it. It almost never came up over the last 18 months because all we discussed in Brexit was the technical details, how Britain was going to, to, to leave, what was the latest battle going on in, in Parliament, which MP was throwing a fit today over which part of the Brexit thing. It was a it was a drama located within about a one kilometer square, two kilometer square space, and it neglected all of the other issues that actually led to the Brexit vote in the first place. And when you consistently frame politics that way, 
And there, you know, there is no major newspaper outlet in this country. I think it's worth saying to your listeners, there's not one whose editorial line backs Corbyn. There are a number that, you know, are favourable to Labour, but when the question came about Corbyn's leadership, all of them, the Guardian, the Mirror, and the New Statesman, who actually won't even back um, uh, Labour in this election, um, they all were in favour of Corbyn going. So there isn't a single media outlet of any size in this country that backs Corbyn's leadership. And so they have simply been involved in ruling his economic and political uh, agenda off the off the table and narrowing a conversation around Brexit to culture war uh, issues, um, which, as as we know, and as I'm sure people in the on the left in the United States know. Um, is a dead end for us because ultimately, you know, confining the political debate to why people vote for someone like a Donald Trump and only looking at, you know, his rhetoric and how boorish he is and whatever and not looking at some of the factors, for instance, in the Midwest, um, about long-term economic decline, the Democratic Party abandoning part of its traditional right. core, the fact that if you don't look at those questions, well, then it always ends up a mystery. Right, right <laughs> absolutely. Know, and there's, and, there's, and always, it's also, it's a mystery, and then the only answers are like religious almost. And, and you know, it's like you just, just can kind of do incantations. But what, I mean, get us deeper into just how dangerous the UK media is and why they've ra- wa- waged this unrelenting war against Corbyn. And if you could connect it, I mean, actually, you already explained the why, but maybe just a little bit more details into the monopolies um, and how they affect it. But then maybe connect it to this incredible conversation about anti-Semitism. Because one, I mean, look, I, I think that from where I see it, there's a little bit more sort of uh, overt anti-Semitism across the board in the UK than there is in the United States, though that's changing. Uh, we've got a press corps uh, approved uh, group that are talking about Jukus here, um, uh, White House press corps approved. But the conservative party in the UK, in both its <laughs> like traditional, like inbred grandee tradition these are not fans of Jewish people. Uh, the former Speaker of the uh, Parliament, John Burkow, in an interview a couple weeks ago where he said, of, cor- you know, of course, Jeremy Corbyn is not an anti-Semite and is a member of the Conservative Party and said, look, I've never com- experienced any anti-Semitism from Labour. I have maybe experienced it from some other parties or party in the UK. And then in the very modern 2019 version, Boris Johnson has apparently been advised by Steve Bannon. He is tight with Donald Trump. There are the same types of spillovers of all of the new, you know, alt-right Nazi type movements, you know, currying their influence as they are obviously in the United States, in the UK, even as one Corbyn and the leadership have condemned anti-Semitism. And then, of course, the other issue that gets involved here is... um, is, you know, the conflation of absolutely correct, essential and valid criticism of the, you know, of the state of Israel uh, conducting, you know, brutal, horrific, systemic human rights abuses on a daily basis uh, and making that anti-Semitism. So, you know, those three things need to be kind of teased apart. And I think the media thing connects because... Yes. I mean, if you read the UK, I mean, there's a big bias against Sanders here. If you read the UK press, it would make Sanders look like he was getting, uh, you know, the press coverage of, um, you know, Beyonce. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, obviously, I have some degree of knowledge of what's going on in the U.S. coverage of Sanders, and I know it is very skewed against them. But as you say, it's nowhere near as skewed as the coverage over here about Corbyn. Um 
And I think the part of the reason is that the left has been off the pitch for a longer time in the United States. Uh, and mm-hmm. so your kind of um, media um, culture is not as well organized in demonizing uh, the you know insurgent socialist figures. Whereas here, particularly because of what we had in the 1970s and 1980s, and you think of things like the miners' strike and all of that, um, you have a press that's very well uh, able, organized around demonizing left-wing and socialist figures. They know how to do it. And in Jeremy Corbyn's case, they went around everything until they found one that's stiff. And that's, that's the truth of it, right? So it was Jeremy Corbyn is a fan of the IRA. Jeremy Corbyn is friends with Hamas. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, you know, uh, won't sing the national anthem. He didn't bow sufficiently at the cenotaph. What did he, you know, what does he think about the Queen? In fact, just today, two of the major newspapers are uh, running front page stories about how Jeremy Corbyn um, doesn't know the time of the Queen's speech on Christmas Day. Oh it's my God! Absurd. It's completely absurd. That's just so ins- that's so happened. offensive, Ronan. Jesus yeah. Christ. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> obviously, as an Irishman, that's not going to that's not going to lose as many votes with me. But the, the bigger <laughs> picture here is uh, that you know they went around until they found something um, that, that that sticks, and that that is this question of the anti-Semitism controversy. Exactly as you said, I think that this is you know one part of an international question that everyone on the left is going to have to grapple with in coming years, where we've got figures. Um, like, say, Viktor Orban, uh, who have very well-established anti-Semitic links to far-right groups who want to rewrite the whole history of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe uh, in order to uh, justify the uh, rise of nationalist forces and demonize the actual partisans who fought against the Nazis. Uh, And these people are now being held up as uh, friends of the Jewish people because they are pro-Israel. Right. And this is happening, you know, in many, many countries with many right-wing demagogues. Um, basically, it's been a policy of the Netanyahu government um, to bring in anyone who's willing to back um, uh, Israel on, uh, you know, human rights abuses, um, the occupation, uh, settlements, uh, Jerusalem as the capital of these questions. Um, and if they're willing to do that, uh, they become somebody who's going to get a lot of press for being friends of the Jewish people, even if, even if their record is very deeply anti-Semitic. Right. Um, and that is reflected here. So where you've got a situation, as you say, that historically in Britain, the left was the home of Jewish politics, you know, if you think of some of the great figures of the British left in recent decades, people like Eric Hobsbawm, people like Ralph Miliband, uh, it it was always the case for a very, very long time that uh, Jewish people in Britain gravitated towards the left, and the left was the kind of pillar against the aristocratic anti-Semitism that ran through so many parts of British society, and particularly the Tory party. Um, And Jeremy Corbyn obviously comes through from an era where those figures, particularly the two I mentioned, people like Topsbaum and and, and Miliband, um, were, you know, the key thinkers in shaping generations of the left and their their worldview. Um, And so, you know, it, it has really been turned on its head. Um, through the last number of years, you did you you had previously seen a kind of a, by degree a migration of vote um, from Jewish communities towards the Tories and, and so on. But this controversy has uh, really changed that historic uh, kind of perspective. Whereas now the only time we're hearing discussion in the press about um, Jewish people in this election is to say that the, the people can't vote for the Labour Party, can't and and, and so on. Um, the truth of it is Jeremy Corbyn actually was uh, a friend of some of the most uh, progressive and radical Jewish people in this country. I think of Max Levitas, who was there at Battle of Cable Street um, when Jewish people and Irish working class people um, gathered together to, uh, to fight against Oswald Mosley and the Union of British Fascists and drive them back from, um, from Cable Street in, in London. Uh, at a key moment when it really was possible that fascism was on the rise in Britain. Well, Max Levitas lived to 
um, you know, 100, 101, 102, whatever age it was. And, and in his final years, he spent many of them sharing stages with Jeremy Corbyn at anti-fascist and anti-racist rallies. Right. So Jeremy Corbyn has a very strong record of standing up for the, the persecuted and the oppressed in general. But partly because this whole international conversation has been reshaped on the terms that I was just saying, where so much of what is, when you go in on Google now and you type in anti-Semitism uh, and you look at the news stories, so much of it is now pivoting around the question of who's you know, a friend of the Jewish people because they're willing to give them critical support to Israel and, and who uh, is not or an enemy of Jewish people because they have a different perspective. Right. So One Jeremy Corbyn is, being a thorough, across-the-board anti-racist and supporter of justice for all in this sick, fascistic worldview where going back, yeah, at least 15 years, I mean, where, you know, Likud and the right specifically have very self-consciously partnered with the evangelical right in the United States and neo-fascists across Europe. Um, and of course, that includes, you know, elements of Tory and Republican Party. Then they can somehow pull off this, you know, lie and fraud about Jeremy Corbyn because, you know, he holds the views on Palestinian rights that, I mean, you know, any decent person would hold. Yeah, I think that's a large part of it. Look, one of the difficulties that we have here is that anti-Semitism um, is a very specific form of racism, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're simultaneously saying that people are subhuman and that they're controlling the world. Right? This, is the, this is the reason why anti-Semitism is specific and uh, complex. Um, we're faced with a media environment that wants to take this issue and simply use it to slander Jeremy Corbyn. doesn't really have any interest in the question of, well, uh, how do we tackle anti-Semitism in the 21st century and what does it look like? They're interested in taking this question and slandering Corbyn with it. Uh, I think the left has a greater responsibility there to, to think ourselves through some of these questions. Um, and ask, you know, is it possible that, say, for instance, a lot of people who gravitate towards the left for the first time who haven't been that interested in politics uh, and, and so forth, you know, they, they see some injustice in Israel, they go onto Google and type in the word Zionist, and they can find, you know, right. things that are quite straightly wrong and anti-Semitic and, you know, conspiracies about right. the Rothschilds and whatever. Like yep. we have to be, uh, we have to be real. But we actually care about the issue and say that happens, and we've got to fight against it. Right. But this is not, you know, uh, characteristic of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party has a lot of left-wing Jewish people in it, a lot of left-wing Jewish people backing his agenda very strongly. In fact, the people who are most active in the anti-fascist and anti-racist struggles in this country are almost uniformly behind Corbyn and the Labour Party. Uh, and it is just really unfortunate that we have this uh, situation um, that has actually a sense amongst a lot of people who are maybe not that political in the Jewish community, when they're seeing headline after headline in the press day after day about Corbyn, you know, being an anti-Semite, that people have a, a concern um, about what, what that means, you know, and if this guy gets elected. Uh, and in my view, you know, that, that is a deeply irresponsible thing um, for the, the press to be uh, convincing people of, where you've got a community that has had a history of persecution and so on, to portray a figure like Jeremy Corbyn, who, yes, you, people might agree with his position on, on, on Israel. He made one mock-up about a mural, um, which, were, you know, yes. became the big story of all of it. Where, and that yeah, was absolutely I mean, a mistake of his, he, without a doubt. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, we should talk about that incident, right? Because okay, I think ahead. it's worth doing. Yep. Where it was on, so it was a mural in his constituency. Some guy had put it up, and there was like, you know, basically New World Order style stuff on it, um, which had anti-Semitic overtones without question. And Corbyn liked and commented something on Facebook about, you know, the council was going to take it down, and he was opposed to it. Almost certainly because, you know, this guy was a local artist who was trying to put up what he considered a political message and whatever, and Corbyn was trying to give him some support. Right. He should have looked at that more clearly. When he did, he apologized for it. But it was a stupid mistake. But taking that and moving it into a point where we are now, where people, you know, are being told that their future in the country is under threat, they will be persecuted, it's so incredibly irresponsible. Um, and and it, it has created a, a serious problem. Uh, 
luckily, luckily, uh, during this campaign, there have been a lot more prominent left-wing Jewish voices. I think of people like David Graeber, the academic who came yeah. out with the statement the other day um, that went viral on Twitter where he talked about this and he said, you know, I'm a, I'm a Jewish person. I have a great knowledge uh, of the history of persecution of Jews as somebody who's a historian and anthropologist. And I can say without any question that people who want to stop uh, the next wave of persecution of Jews should be voting for socialists and not right. somebody who's piling up with far right and um, figures like Viktor Orban across Europe. 100%. Um, in 2017, that was actually a story of the polls being wrong and missing a huge grassroots in, uh, uh, outpouring of support for Corbyn's Labour Party and for democratic socialism. Do you... Um, I saw some encouraging numbers recently on a spike in uh, young people registering to vote, which is obviously a great signal for labor. The Lib Dems are collapsing. That's obviously really positive. What do you, I mean, you know, this is the what do you think might happen here question. Does labor have a shot at forcing a hung parliament, denying the Tories the power to complete their destruction? Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say that uh, I think it's a tough one. And I think this is a question that the left internationally is going to have to grapple with, you know. Um, we're facing huge structural obstacles. A total kind of power of concentrated wealth being against us, all of the big media being against us. In Britain, you know, the political apparatus in the Labour Party, most of it being against them for most of this time. Uh, to overcome all of those obstacles and get radical policies introduced is a very hard thing to do. It's part of the reason why, you know, there has been this inexorable drift towards inequality across the world. Is that it's a very hard thing to overcome the obstacles in our way. Uh, but every time the Labour Party uh, gets into an election campaign, what, what do we see? We see that the poll difference that have been there tightens because right. people get exposed to the actual arguments. Right. Not some bizarre distortion presented by Rupert Murdoch-owned media. Or, I mean, to give you a context, right, 60% of the newspapers read in this country every day are about two companies, the Daily Mail Group and Rupert Murdoch's News UK. I mean, that's 60%, right? So they are pu pushing out every single day into thousands of homes. Uh, they are pushing out anti-Corbyn propaganda. And then it isn't until people get to experience an election campaign where Labour mobilizes, you know, half a million people uh, to knock on doors, to campaign for the party and to talk about their actual policies and what they would mean for people's lives. We see a resurgence. Uh, and this has happened in 2017. And now we're seeing it again in 2019. The question of whether we can overcome the scale of the obstacles, you know, in, a, in such a short period of time or just a few weeks where people are actually you know, being encouraged to listen to things about the NHS again. No one has talked about the NHS for so long with Brexit. It's just been like off the table and not considered. And then people are being given just a few kind of weeks and this short, sharp shock to think about the NHS, their kids' schools, their wages, all of these questions. Um, whether we can do it, I'm not sure. There are some positive signs. The gap is closing again for the reason I've said. Um, a lot of the polling companies are using models for this election that are based on low turnout amongst young people, like significantly down, about a quarter or a third down um, under 35 from uh, the last election. Um, and some of them go up to like having significantly lower turnout under 50. Um, I would be surprised if that happens, but it could. I mean, the December election has a lot of problems to us. Uh, a lot of people are working terrible shifts, you know, Christmas shifts. Um, it's cold out there. Um, you know, it's a very different atmosphere to the June election. Uh, but the voter registration information it indicates something else. Uh, it's the largest increase that we have seen in the modern times of young people registering to vote. Um, whether or not that can tip labor over, I don't know. I have to say that there are, you know, some of these people who get a bit worried when politics gets realigned in young versus old basis and whatever, not only because it can be damaging to kind of class politics, 
Um, but also because the record is like very clear, right, that older people come out and vote and they do it reliably and they do it in big numbers and younger people are, are, are less so. But it is certainly the case that a lot of young people have registered to vote. And if those registration numbers are reflected in turnout, then the polling rules that we've seen, you will not be right. It might still be a Tory majority, we don't know, but it simply won't be the case if those registration numbers are reflected that we're going to have a huge, like one-third drop in, in under 35 voting while millions of young people have registered. That seems unlikely. Ronan Burton Shaw, Solidarity, good luck. If you're in the UK, my God, don't fuck around. <laughs> Vote for Labour. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, I appreciate it, guys. All right, folks, uh, become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how this show happens. That's how you fight all of the media monopolies that uh, propagandize this world. Check out justcoffee.coop, fair trade tea, coffee, or chocolate. Get the Majority Report blend. Then, of course, become a patron of the Michael Brooks Show, patreon.com slash tmbs. Check out last night's... Uh, or Tuesday's conversation with Big Waz, Wozni Lambre, and Slavoj Zizek, which was brilliant. This Sunday uh, for patrons, an in-depth, deep dive on the history from today to 2011 of Egypt, what happened and why. Um, and then you can see a link on the Majority of FM homepage, The Bell House, February 7th, TMBS is back live. We just sold out Philly. It was an amazing show. It was great. Everybody loved it. It was fantastic. Thank you. And this one's, we're just going to do like a mega show, taking it back in New York. We've got pretty bad lefty, BJ Sutton, joining us. We've got Alona Minkowski. What? Uh, he, BJ is going to be in studio tomorrow for Majority Report, actually. Rad. He's joining us. Alona Minkowski is joining us. Harvey K is joining us. Ben Burgess is joining us. And there's going to be one other secret to be announced uh get your tickets today i can tell you they're going fast and in the previous shows we filled it up but you could go and buy it at the box office i swear to god in philly i walked in there was a woman she said hi shook hands she said i'm waiting to see if there's any extra tickets because it's sold out so don't do that Snag your tickets to the Bell House today, February 7th. Incredibly excited. Um, also, if you haven't yet, subscribe to Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. We're at 91,000 subs and want to get to 100,000 subs before the new year. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, Sean sits down with fellow socialist train guy, Justin Rosniak, a.k.a. Do Not Eat. He's a big bread tuber. To get at the real and sordid history Behind the 1988 blockbuster, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, how was this crazy film made? What does it tell us about the history of public transit in Los Angeles and elsewhere? Why is Elon Musk full of crap? Uh, how would the rail fit into the Green New Deal and socialism in general? And uh, more importantly, how did our fans get us to watch hentai? Because that's basically what Who Framed Roger Rabbit is. It's a sexy cartoon. Check it out. Um, also, still want to plug my show from last week. Think it's really important. Um, I spoke with three organizers from the world of sex work. Rachel Rabbit White, Nina Lowe from Decrim NY, and Oyster about organizing in the world of sex work and why socialists should care about decriminalization as a workers' rights issue and not just some kind of uh, libertarian thing. And then we had a real Kolontai hours with the same guests on Friday for our patrons, wherein modern-day workers read uh, Kolontai's 100-year-old treatise on uh, prostitution and ways of fighting it and uh, kind of evaluated it in terms of our lives today. So... Check it out. Patreon.com slash The Antifada. Colin Ty, folks. Great stuff. More and more people have been talking about more her. More and more people actually have been talking about her. For good reason. Uh, literary Hangover, we talk about Arthur Miller, why he said uh, market capitalism is ruining uh, or killed the theater, uh, and McCarthyism and the Salem Witch Trials and what those two things uh, share in common. That is terrifyingly relevant for everything we're talking about. 
Folks, Hunt a Killer is a subscription game that thrusts you and your friends and your family into an ongoing murder mystery investigation. With every delivery, you'll sift through piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files, eliminating suspects until you solve the case and catch the killer. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com and use promo code MAJORITY to get 20% off of your first box. They even have gift cards for all holiday shopping, not to mention they're throwing in exclusive bundles for the holiday season. So make sure to use promo code MAJORITY at huntakiller.com for 20% discount to show your support for the show. Huntakiller.com, code MAJORITY. All right, folks, we'll see you on the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Sent us this. <laughs> alpha males are back. back. When started, it did not back. move back. with a constant. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back. 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 Boy, back. And the alpha males are back. 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 Just want to degrade the white man. The white alpha males are back. Back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks. Fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Uh, 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 says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Welcome, welcome to the fun half, everybody. Um, still trying to fire up the IMs here. We will start by taking a call. You're calling from a 301 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. It's Andrew from DC. How y'all doing? Hey, Andrew. How you doing, man? What's on your mind? I'm doing well. Uh, hey, I uh, I wanted to say uh, I'm actually trying to get through. Uh, I don't know how many weeks now since you had David Ross from Deadspin on um, what a heartbreak it was to see that go down, and uh, it actually inspired me. I finally became a member because I think it's so important to support independent me- independent media like you guys. So, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But uh, it, I wanted to thank you guys. I mean, I was uh, pretty hard on the libertarian train for a long time. Oh wow! Uh, thankfully, I was never. I was never dumb enough to go down the Dave Rubin route, but, uh, you know, I like that the is definitely another of level of so dumb. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, like, thanks to you guys. And, you know, part of, you know, why Deadspin was important to me. I've been reading that since college 
Uh, and the thing that always kept me engaged is how funny they were. Like I just, right. the humor of it. And I think that's what you guys do so well is you're so funny about serious topics, but you know, it's, it's, it's easy to, it's easy to enjoy. Thanks, um, so I, I said, thanks. Uh, so on that note, I wanted to say like, who do you guys, I wish Sam was there cause I'd love to hear his topic, but as far as, you know, I know you guys talk about movies and music, but as far as like stand up comedians and comedians, who do you guys think is the, maybe your the best one you think from a political angle or just oh. in general? For my uh, vote, I, I love I, early Dave Chappelle. I love all Dave Chappelle. Political comic. I love all Dave Chappelle. Uh, Adam Friedland. Adam Friedland is funny. Uh, <laughs> Stavros, uh, whatever his name I'm, is. Adam's a nice guy. Um, no, those are they, that is a funny podcast. Uh, Bill Burr's new special is funny. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, don't have like any. Bill Burr's one. But what? I'm not a big fan of. Oh, Bill I liked Burr's it. One. Um, it was a bit one note, but it was the big, it, the, 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 yeah, fair, but um. I don't know, man. I that's and then my problem as, with this is there aren't many new. I, one is like I don't really see like uh, I, I hope that I did not get this bug from Sam actually, where I like increasingly cannot enjoy stand up in general, and uh, you know I don't know. I don't think um, like a lot of new meme comedy and stuff that I see is not particularly funny to me. So I'm trying to think of, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not a big comedy nerd, but I got to give a shout out to my friend, Jake Flores. He's always very funny. He's also one of the most hapless people I know, which is also funny. <laughs> okay. Um, constantly <laughs> getting things stolen. No, like in a, <laughs> in a really adorable, endearing way. Um, I, I, th I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't put their politics as the number one metric of, yeah, for how I judge, not. um, yeah. comedians. I sort of think comedians are like, you know how, um, these talk about the cynics and the, uh, like they used to have a class of individuals based on how you inter in interact with the world. And I think comedians can be given a bit more leeway on certain political things. Um, but Dion Cole's new, uh, special is, uh, oh. interesting. So I would say check that. I one also out. heard that, uh, ha Tiffany Haddish, is that her name? I haven't seen her. Adish. I've actually heard her new special is hilarious, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, what I really miss. Oh, just, hey, real quick before, I, before yeah. real quick before I jump, I just want to say two things. Uh, one, thanks to you, I've actually become a regular contributor to Bernie and Shahid Buttar. That guy is awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And two, speaking of comedy, please don't drop the uh, the new Bernie impression, Angry Bernie. That was that's your second. No, it's best not angry. It's, it's, it's immoral Obama. Bernie, and it's not going anywhere. Uh, by the way, I do, have, I do have to say, brother. I mean, Majority Report, yes. Bernie Shahid, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to hope that a TMBS membership is in there pretty soon. <laughs> Speaking of I, funny. I subscribe. I subscribe. Um, you're going to be my first Patreon. There you go. Yeah, as soon as I get there it. There you go. How about this? I'll do this for you. My there dad, I'll do this for you. I, uh, just, just as a hedge on my happiness, I actually bet on uh, Pete Buttigieg to become the, Democrat, uh, the Democratic primary winner. Just because if Bernie's not going to win, I, I don't know how else to do it. So at least I have money. If he ends up getting it, I'll give you all the profit. I can't take that blood money. It's going straight to you. How about well, that? Well, that sounds good, but you should join beforehand. But I just want to say, if, uh, <laughs> if, if to everybody who's preparing yourself for the worst scenario in the Democratic primary, it's not Pete Buttigieg, it's Joe Biden. And I will continue to say what I've said for a long time, which is he's weak. His numbers are bad, all of the obvious things about him, but still leads in the polls. And now we're in December. Uh, thanks yeah, for the call, brother. People, so Appreciate it, go. man. Thanks for the call. David Feldman and yeah. uh, Andy, too, of course. Oh, David Feldman, yes. And, of course, and, Andy's super funny. I, I, I think Andy's hilarious, but I will say, like, Feldman is actually one of the only podcasts that I regularly – I don't listen to all of it, but – I basically I listen to a chunk of every single David Feldman show. I laugh hardest David on this Feldman. show when I'm hearing David Feldman on. David the Feldman's hilarious. He's genius. Oh, can I make one more very on-brand recommendation? Um, I've really been enjoying Los Spookies, which is a Spanish language show about a group of enterprising goths in an unnamed Latin American city. And uh, yeah, I know. Very on brand. Julio Torres is a writer on it and a star of the show. He's very funny. Fred Armisen is a part of it. And uh, yeah, anyone who likes my aesthetic will probably enjoy Los Spookies. It also helps me with my Spanish. 
Uh, my favorite comedian That's right cool. now is uh, Danny McBride. Oh yeah, you, you know what? Wow. In I terms of political statements and comedic that... art, it's the his three series. I, I, I thought think we were talking about stand ups. Oh yeah. No, I, I mean, know. If I, we're I'm broadening cheating. comedy out. The Righteous Gemstone is one of the funniest things I've seen, and also like weirdly poignant. Like that's a really good show. Sean uh, from Cal. I knew John Kennedy, and John Kennedy is no John Kennedy. I think that's the uh, second time for that. Uh, uh, Colin from Nebraska. I saw how Republicans exploded over Carlin's comments on Barron on Fox News. Trish Regan and Representative Zeldin discussed how children should be off limits, including Hunter Biden. Trish Regan says at the 340 mark, Hunter Biden, who is, yeah, she stops herself. You can only guess what she's about to say. Crackhead? LOL. He's so uh, cool. Yeah. I was say, Sorry, Dad. <laughs> uh, goth Koala. Interesting that the all rational atheist, big brain boys, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Bill Maher, etc., aren't talking about the coup of Morales and the fact that fascist Christian theocrats have forcibly taken over Brazil, Bolivia. If you knew that Janine uh, Anez had walked to the presidential palace carrying a comically oversized Quran saying Bolivia belongs to Mohammed, <laughs> these gargoyles would be all over the discourse. Well, of course. And also, if you even go and look, like, if you look at the most obscene, horrifying atrocities that ISIS has committed, uh, the closest parallel is actually, uh, like, as an example, the El Salvadoran death squads that the Reagan administration backed in terms of just like the choreography of gruesomeness and evil. And of course, you don't hear, look, you don't hear anything from those people because they don't know shit. The liars. Uh, they're yeah, they're idiots. They suck. They're not good. I mean, remember when Jordan Peterson met with Orban and Wine, uh, one of the Weinstein's made this big deal about I wasn't at this meeting where he agreed to uh, talk to him about this. Uh, this is very troubling. Have you heard any follow up of that? No. No. And you're not going to get any. And you're not going to get any. Uh, let's do this kind of funny. I actually say like I actually basically I am somewhere on the spectrum of agreeing with this. I I don't really have a problem with uh, people uh, you know sort of like making meaning for themselves in whatever way they do. I, you know, I, I think um, uh, the atheism thing is great of the old school. The Sam Harris uh, new atheist version is, is uh, lame and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not impressed with it. So, uh, but watching Dave Rubin think through anything is funny. I have to say for someone like me who will laugh at pretty much anything, I only say semi-ironically the word ableist does come to mind, <laughs> but this is hilarious. Dave Rubin has new thoughts on <laughs> religion and, and making meaning. and He's going full trad. Uh, I, whatever. It's just funny. So I grew up in a conservative Jewish household in New York. Um, we kept kosher. We did uh, Shabbat on Friday nights, all, all the big holidays. Um, but there was a strong secular belief within that. And as I was telling you sort of backstage, um, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting piece related to Judaism that I think is a little different than other religions in that the ethnic tie to it at least in a modern way, is for most <laughs> Jews more important than the religious nature of it specifically, let's say belief specifically, uh, because John, as we were talking about, there are many, many Jews, Pause especially in, in... You know what, you know what really does make it funny is that the guy has clearly never had a thought in his life, right? Like he's a, he's clearly like, he's not a smart person in my opinion. Opinion. No, he doesn't and, have thoughts. He has ideas. Excuse me. He has ideas. And in, and in the opinion of many people who've known Dave, Dave is not like the most, you know, he's not the, the sharpest tool in the shed. But he's got like his like, you know, kind of off brand. Like he he knows how to look at a picture of what a thinker is supposed to look like. So he's doing like the hand movements and he's doing the, he's got the yeah, legs crossed. He's like a he's dumb guy's the, idea of a smart guy. He's the dumb guy's, no, no, they he, got the leather he's the chairs dumb up. guy's idea of how to impersonate a smart guy with a TED talk mic. And you're still actually watching him do this. It's like, it's like somebody going out in like, you know, in, in a LeBron jersey and then, just, just it's a simulation 
It's a very funny simulation. Specifically, let's say belief specifically, uh, because John, as we were talking about, there are many, many Jews, especially in, in sciences and in mathematics, that aren't believers per se, but have a real cultural affinity. And I would say that that's sort of where I'm at, um, or at least where I've been over the last couple of years. I actually, so he was, so he's just, just to be clear, he was with all those secular Jewish sort of right. scientists and right. mathematicians. And then I signed with Glenn Those guys Beck. are idiots. Yeah. <laughs> and then Sam Harris, even he began to be embarrassed to be associated with me. I'm like, I don't know if Spinoza <laughs> really has enough figured out. Let me go on tour with Jordan <laughs> Peterson. <laughs> over the last couple of years. I actually am now in the last few years, and this has to do uh, a lot with being on tour with Jordan Peterson for a year. Uh, Jordan and I did about 110 stops in, in one calendar year in about 20 countries. It was pretty amazing. And, and when you spend that kind of time listening to a, a true innovative thinker, I mean, truly the guy that I think is, is the world's most important public philosopher, let's say, um, you know, talking about his Oof. biblical lectures and talking about his perspective on life and that there has to be a bedrock of something that is real and true outside of us. And then how he relates that through the, the biblical stories. Um, it moved me. It moved me over the course of, of the year that we did this together. You know what's so great is that it's like, it is some version of, you know, if it's effective, run with it, which I tend to agree with. But this is not like the idea that that is some like world shaking foundational rethinking. And then it's like, you just like Jordan Peterson's up there working himself into a tizzy talking about Job and Dave's there just like, whoa. Oh no! Look, Cootie Pie did a Hitler mustache. That's funny. <laughs> I'm not, you know, the most important philosopher like Jordan Peterson. But <laughs> the whole bit about there must be something uh, beyond us. Uh, he's wrong about that, and in, in a specific sense, um, meaning is socially produced. It's not produced by God or any sort of transcendent force, which is what this is searching What's for. What's right funny here. is that Peterson at times sort of acknowledges that. In a way, if I'm reading, so it's almost like, no, there is like a conservative postmodern ten. It's almost like we need to have that. So let's make it up. Let's, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I mean, that's that, where you get into certain types of mythologizing and fascism. I think. Well, I, mean, I think I would say without a doubt, yeah. but I just think it's, it's interesting because he, but he, but I like, because it's Dave, he, it seems like Dave's just saying like, I mean, it has to be there. And also, sometimes Jordan Peterson totally is on that. Like, like I don't know, if you look at the double helix and uh, the pyramids, exactly. there's obviously something else going on. Well, I think we all know why Jordan Peterson keeps him around, especially after he got so savagely owned by our beautiful boy, Slovoy, Oof. recently. Like, he needs he got someone... gently owned. He needs somebody who is impressed by the size of his brain, and that's Dave Rubin. Also, I'm calling it maybe six months until Dave becomes a full Jew for Jesus. Oh, yeah, totally. I think you're I think you're 100% right, and I think you're on the timeline. Also, mm -hmm. this is... What is this on Christian something or other? Uh, yeah, Christian, premier Christian radio. Imagine, imagine like Hitler talking about crypto, you know, their sort of like mythologies they did. Like there must be some, there must be something, to, I can't do it. Why can't I do it? There has to be something to, 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 that is outside. That is real and outside of us. <laughs> well, you know, he does have a certain low cunning. His career pivot is going in a, a direction. Yeah, uh, but it's a direction that we sort of, well, yeah, I think we sort we, of forced well, it. I think we helped. I think, I think he would prefer to be being like, hey, these interesting uh, ideas. And actually, Majority Report <laughs> helped me on my spiritual yeah, journey. Yeah, Majority Report helped me realize that I was a classic Christian theater. If they didn't pigeonhole me as a crypto <laughs> right winger, I would have never went on tour with yeah. Jordan Peterson for a, a half a year and yeah. changed my entire belief system. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> you I've been really critically rethinking Spinoza. <laughs> I used to be there, but then I went. <laughs> I used to, to be there, <laughs> and I met. I I, I I read Maps of Meaning. I'm like Spinoza. Your universe is empty. <laughs> By the way, Maps of Meaning sucks. I actually I had to read. 
Yeesh. I thought that was going to be better, man. The part where he has a sex dream about his grandmother sounds pretty lit. No, it was about uh, his niece, I believe. And it was... No, what what's funny about it is is that it's it it's basically like, well, I, I don't even want to get into it. I, I'm, I'm burned out. All right. Um, so in well, Brazil, Reddit thinks it's his grandma, but we'll leave it there. Oh, uh, <laughs> maybe. In Brazil, uh, President Lula has been released from over a year political imprisonment now for over uh, about three weeks or so. There is, and, and, you know, I, I talked about this on TMBS. I don't remember what I talked about it on here, but uh, Sloppy Steve, who is connected, Steve Bannon connected to the Bolsonaro regime in Brazil, gave an interview the day Lula was released. And he said, Lula is a symbol for the globalists everywhere. Now, I don't know whether he thinks that uh, Lula is Jewish. Um, and Lula is certainly not, you know, contrary. To, I, I know that there's some, you know, left uh, purist objections. Lula is not a neoliberal. Lula is a labor union operative who d d democratized Brazil and lifted between 30 and 40 million people out of poverty and knows how to operate. And as he has been released, is talking clearly about one, saving Brazilian democracy. And more broadly, he is putting forward a critique of everything from Uber and the temporary economy and thinking through what we could say social democracy would look like in the 21st century. So there are global implications to this. A appeals court recently affirmed his corruption sentence. Now, everybody knows that one, he was put in jail on one charge, which was accepting a beachfront property, which there was no evidence that he owned or had even set foot in more than once or twice. We know from the Intercept reporting that the Lava Jato team, which was a legal task force backed by the United States that targeted state industries and the left in Brazil, was not only committed to politically persecuting Lula, had a bizarre, extreme, and obsessive and deranged hatred of him and his family, and that Sergio Moro, the judge that sentenced him without evidence, became Bolsonaro's justice minister. So why would this regional court do that? And it doesn't matter for now because the Supreme Court's given its ruling and Lula is, is free for now. And ultimately, if Brazilian democracy survives, he's free and he's out and he's a leader. And if it fully succumbs to fascism, he may well uh, be returned. That's what's at stake. But in the ruling, they didn't mention any of the new intercept evidence, which the Supreme Court re referred to, uh, the leaks exposing the corruption of Lava Jato. And another thing that has come to my attention from a report in the indispensable Brazil Wire that everybody needs to read, which is that before this ruling by this regional court, they were visited twice by what the Brazil Wire describes as a notorious U.S. intelligence official or diplomatic official. I'm going to quote now. The controversial regional federal court four in Porto Alegre has been hit with a fresh scandal, one which reopens the question of U.S. interference in Brazilian law and its judiciary for political ends. On Tuesday, December 2nd, 2019, Willard Tenney Smith, a former DIA and CIA intelligence official and now a political advisor at the U.S. Embassy in Brasilia, was received in Porto Alegre by Judge Victor Luis da Santos Las president of the TRF Regional 4 Court in Porto Alegre. The timing of the visit has caused concern given the uh, T TRF's handling of the appeals by former President Lula da Silva. The court's official explanation for the visit was that it was part of an effort on Tanny Smith's part to understand the workings of the Brazilian judiciary, to which I will add, I bet. The official was accompanied by Rebecca Martinez and Aline Vecchia, advisor and assistant for political and economic affairs at the U.S. consulate in Porto Alegre. Das Santos Las said he considered it important for bodies such as the U.S. Embassy to be able to approach the Brazilian judiciary and courts, which he said enabled greater integration and articulation between institutions. Such informal collaboration between U.S. agencies and Brazilian prosecutors was remitted by acting attorney general Kenneth Blanco in 2017, 
who boasted of Lula's persecution as a success story. This contact and collaboration, which bypassed the foreign ministry and ignored a 2001 decree in cooperation between two countries in criminal cases, was presented to the uh, TRF4 by former presidents by the former president Lula's defense as grounds for an annulment of the so-called triplex case, which the court oversaw in 2018. So there is no question that the United States has aggressively been seeking regime changes in various forms across Latin America. Going back, if we want to talk the current wave, the hybrid coup of 2019, which the Clinton State Department backed in Honduras. And uh, Lula's freedom now is essential for Brazil, but because of Brazil's strategic stakes and his stature, it has global implications. And this is a you know another great example too of like, of course we know the right, the authoritarians and the intelligence apparatus and people that are angry that the workers party wouldn't privatize Petrobras are gonna be targeting them. But you know, where's the hashtag resistance on this? I also wanna play, uh, this is just a, a funny clip because the, you know, the lunatic right wing in Brazil and the, just, you know, the immoral avarice center as exemplified by Enrique Cardozo. By the way, uh, Bolsonaro sucking up has earned him uh, some tariffs from Trump, which is hilarious um, and pathetic and embarrassing. Um, they are talking about Lula da Silva, who says we respect the mandate of an illegitimate election that he would have won, <laughs> literally was put in prison to avoid him winning when he led by double digits. He says, we're going to respect the mandate because we believe in democratic institutions who turned himself into prison instead of leaving on illegitimate corrupted charges from a right wing judiciary, like a literal actual deep state political prosecution. He's done all of this. And yet these assholes have the temerity that because he's also called for protests and praises what's happening in Chile and Ecuador and, and Colombia, that he is promoting violence in Brazil. Now, this uh, Twitter user, this is actually funny, uh, and the translate is weird. Lula does literally translate into English as squid. But uh, <laughs> basically, it says, loose squid or Lula is a danger to society. It incites violence and threatens democracy. Below is Lula threatening democracy. And here is Grandpa Lula <laughs> dancing with some people. <laughs> Oh, oh he's, he's he's loose. He's perfected the Klobuchar. Uh, how dare you? By the way, that's not that's. I think it's a little more chill than Klobuchar. So there is President Lula da Silva, former political prisoner, uh, threatening violence and incitement against the regime that has direct connections to paramilitaries that assassinated that have Marielle Franco. It's just unbelievable. Just a, just a simple recounting of facts in right. Brazil should be enough to radicalize anybody. Literally. Exactly. It should be, shouldn't it? You're calling from a 303 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is the letter hack from Twitter. Hey, are you the artist known as letter yeah, hack? Those are my comics. That's amazing, yeah. man. How you doing? How, thanks for the work. Yeah, no problem. I'm doing well. How are you guys? Good. Good. Just wanted to take a quick second, um, considering Sam's recent comments on how long it takes to get to the emails. I thought I should follow up to an email I sent a while back about that meme project Sam also mentioned a while back. Okay. I don't know uh, anything about either this of these was, things, to be honest with you. So. So this was the project to help folks get in on inside jokes and references made on the show. Mm, oh, that's and right, right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. So I, I had suggested a collaboration in making some, if not all, of those memes into comics in some way. Mm -hmm. And I'll add now that just considering the quickness to which I make those comics, if I were involved, I think it's safe to say that project would be done by now. I think you're probably right. Uh, so look, email Sam. 
No, I think you're totally right. Okay. I think I'm amazed by your workflow. Yeah, uh, how do you make those comics oh, so thanks. fast? I'm literally amazed. But, well, can you answer that just in a second? But can you, I will specifically, we will tell Sam if you send a specific email that says, attention meme project slash guy who does everything. And we will get okay. Sam to yeah. get on it immediately. <laughs> because clearly your turnaround time is like so now yes jamie's question how do you get that done so fast that's crazy well you know those comics that i do every day are off the cuff um if i took longer they'd be that much better right so i'm really just churning them out but that's sort of the nature of being a cartoonist man you got to crank it out all right you know there's a, you can't waste time so that's Word. you know once i get an idea i just draw it you know fast awesome. as you can be that's that's how you're a daily cartoonist in the industry awesome all right well thanks matt send yeah. that email we'll we'll get on sam's case because if you're willing to help right. with that i think it would help the show a lot and you know i mean that's the bottom line is, is there's just an objective limited amount of time here so you know if yeah. if you want to help with that though let's let's do it thanks bud yeah keep on making us right look on. cute appreciate it um all right let's do okay oh really quick uh Love the Labor Manifesto, but I heard the uh, unredacted papers, Corbin's, uh, Corbin said that the Tories are putting the NHS on the p chopping block. Don't actually prove that. Can you speak to that? I don't want to hurt labor when their agenda is so fantastic. Well, I would say don't, then don't do it, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it, here's like a, th like a three-step process for something like that. I, my read uh, was that, in fact, it did show that the private negotiating position of the Tories was definitely that uh, NHS was open to um, investment and, and participation from U.S. insurance companies if they negotiated a free trade agreement with the U.S., which is what a major part of their Brexit strategy hinges on. Like, they need that capital infusion, and they want to... And they do, they want, but um, I, you know, like the real bottom line is, is that yes, the Tories want to gut the NHS. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, Don't get worried American in all this pedantic, not like people can, you know, like, well, actually, like, this is why I get so frustrated with well, actually stuff. There are times where you need precision, where you need to make, be able to make a distinction and no one and so on. But the Tories want to gut and have already massively destroyed the UK social safety system have caused thou of course a huge increase in poverty. People have died and they have wanted to get rid of the NHS forever. And they already have messed with it significantly, including of course the Lib Dems and the right wing of labor. And if you think that the NHS, which by the way, uh, Boris Johnson wrote a column years ago that was dug up recently where he said people should pay for NHS visits, um, that's the truth. You know, don't let the, the silly little quibbles distract from it. If you care about the NHS, you vote labor. That's it. Everything else is silly. Um, I mean, just, uh, I don't yeah. know much specifically about these documents, yeah. but I can say that it looks like the Daily Telegraph is saying that Corbyn was tricked by fake documents, but the Daily Telegraph previously had run a story based on the exact same documents. So who knows? It's probably just some bullshit. Look, maybe, look, even if it's a rat fuck. Maybe they... It points to truth. It's the truth. Under Lib Dems and Tories, the NHS will be destroyed. You don't want... You want to protect the NHS, you vote Labor. Everything else is irrelevant. All right, let's actually play some sound. This is Jeremy Corbyn. And one of the things that's so incredible about the demonization and the just relentless lies, distortion and propaganda about Jeremy Corbyn is that he really just has this elemental decency about him. And I think, you know, I think some people, you know, like Martin Amos doesn't like that Jeremy Corbyn's a vegetarian and he doesn't have an ironic sense of humor. Yeah. I don't you know? like that Martin Amos who is cares? five foot three. Right. Exactly. I mean, that, you know, who, but that's, you know, but, when it is all said and done, you have a decent person who has dedicated the, their life to improving the lot of the majority, not just in his home country, but everywhere, who has basic principles, which any person with any basic decency would share. 
And it is a testament to media monopoly propaganda uh, and and social herd force that this guy would be unpopular or that he doesn't have the temperament to be prime minister. I mean, this is actually exactly the temperament that you want to encourage in executive positions. Here he is on uh, ITV this morning talking about his views of public service. Are you just exhausted with all of this? No. I, you must be. <laughs> I mean, everybody's exhausted this time of year. It's coming up to Christmas. There's so much more to do anyway. And yet you're mm -hmm. doing this day in, day out. Aren't you just like, don't you just want to sit back and put your feet up and go, is no. it all worth it? No, not a, not a bit of it. Why? You get up each day and you go out and you do what you believe in. You do your campaigning. Is you there as much pride in the job? Because sometimes I think, God... For a politician, is there as much pride in your job? I've represented my constituency since 1983, and I love the people I represent. I know many, many very, very well, of course, and know their families and so on. It feels like home and family. Mm -hmm. And I believe in public service. I believe in representing people. And I passionately believe in a country where we don't have homeless people, where mm -hmm. we don't have food banks, where we don't have four million children going to school hungry or poor or unable to achieve their best in life. And I want to bring about a fairer, more just, more equal society. That's what I've spent my whole life doing. Yeah. And this, I travel all around the country meeting people. Last night I was talking to a group of homeless people in Hastings, but also talking to people who are wanting to expand their work and their businesses. The two things actually go together. Mm -hmm. And so those, the wisdom that's there amongst people all over the country is something that absolutely aspire, inspires me. You should vote for some blubbering trust fund baby sociopath who was a right wing media columnist over that. I mean, I honestly like let me pull a Trump here. Like, how stupid are you people? He's you would so vote good. for the Lib Dems under some former uh, FM uh, uh, disc jockey programmer who has nothing to say except smears of Corbyn, Brexit fear mongering and austerity and the most in. Embarrassing. I mean, um, um, social plans that in 2019 uh, would be laughed at by Pete Buttigieg in terms of their just utter insufficiency for any problems to do with housing or healthcare, as an example. And then you have that guy and he's not he's not leading in a landslide. If you're not voting for Jeremy Corbyn, you are either an oligarch, in which case respect you're the enemy or you're uh, a sucker of the highest degree. Uh, that meme, I forget who first shared it. I wish I could remember it. It's definitely not me, but there's the meme of the guy who's like, you know, he's there at the stadium and the NBA players are walking out. I don't remember which team and he's got his hand up and they're all just ignoring him. You're that guy. You're the ultimate self cuck. Not voting for Jeremy Corbyn unless you're an oligarch is so stupid. So stupid. Are you blaming the electorate, Michael? That's my version of blaming the electorate. Yep. It's one thing if the electorate says, I don't like the choices, you know, legitimately. But you've got a choice here that's really positive from the perspective of anybody who's not an oligarch. And the only reason you wouldn't see it as positive, and look, to be fair, there's, there's even worse uh, media monopoly in the UK. So you've been totally propagandized. But you have an opportunity. And even people like I, I, I admired some of the things that Nicola Sturgeon has said, and I have some respect for the S&P uh, position, although I would, I would vote Labour wherever I could in the UK, period. But, I mean, even her, who's supposed to be, who has some good social democratic credentials, who hacked into Cameron well, is still talking about Corbyn and Johnson as if they even represent you know, anywhere within the realm of the same threat level, like this buffoonish thug versus a decent social Democrat who has been on the right side of basically everything. Well, he has to break through decades worth of messaging that people have received that labor's not doing anything for them. They've heard it all before. You know, if you haven't been paying close attention to his career, to his ideology, whatever, whatever, 
It sounds like the same stuff that people have told you before when they were lying. I think in this case, it's the, no, I think in this case, it's the right, it's the right wing lies about him in this case, because it's very clear. I mean, they understand that he's different than a Tony Blair and Blair, you know, look, Blair and Brown played a super different game. They made, they actually were even more effective than a lot of Democrats here too, because what they did is they just made narrowly tailored promises and kept them. But I, I the problem in the UK I don't think is lack of belief in the agenda. It is total belief in the absolute slander that is pumped out about him on a daily basis, which runs contrary to just like his very presence. I mean, he, even the new statesman won't uh, endorse Corbyn, and everybody cancel you if you're yeah, a sub, cancel, cancel your new, new statesman and let them know about oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Yes. yes. I, I'm just thinking back to the video I saw that Novara Media did where they were interviewing working class, lots of people of color yeah. in different parts of the country. And some of them were like, yeah, Jeremy Corbyn. And others were like, I don't see how this is going to help. Labor hasn't done shit for us. And like, it, they have a reason to believe that. Well, what's crazy to me about on that front is like, you guys have, you guys passed the NHS. Yes. Like we, I just think like the example there in the UK to be like, go for it. You can do it is it, it should be easier. It should be a much easier sell to make midi doctor. The Lib Dems are crypto Tories, but they are a strategic choice in some constituencies like race, like uh, Redwoods or Jacob Reese Moggs labor won Canterbury in 2017 by virtue of changing demographics and tactical voting by Lib Dems. Don't be a dumb, dumb engage locally. Finally hit the like button. So here's my problem. You know better than me, although I doubt you know better than Ronan, frankly. So I see you're answering what Ronan said, but I would not take your word over his, just to be blunt. But here's my second point about tactical voting for the Lib Dems. I'm all for tactical voting in general, but they will coalition with the Tories and back the Tory agenda. So what are you actually saying here? In a different political environment, with Cameron and Clegg, and you had Nick Clegg actually way more popular and formidable than this uh, Swinson character. He coalitioned with Cameron and did everything. The, the, the Tory devastation of 2010 to 2015 is a co-joint Lib Dem product. So what are you saying here? I like, I, what, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I, it's, I think in certain cases, I think SNP maybe, maybe Clyde Mayer, I think in Wales. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously it would be great if, if Sinn Féin, uh, you know, would go into parliament with Labour. But I, it, it, to me, it's like you're saying the closest analogy I could think of in, in the, it's like in the United States, maybe there is a more moderate Republican that we like over a more reactionary one. But actually the ultimate question is, is are they going to be voting for Mitch McConnell as Senate majority leader? So there's no, so unless you told me that the Lib Dems who have their own marginalized social democratic faction, because they kind of occupied a bit more the left when labor was to the right under Blair, then, and that, that social Dem faction was, genuinely triangulating and would consider a partnership with labor, then you'd have a case, but there's nothing that they're saying. They've been there. All they do is attack Corbyn and labor and their most recent moves are teaming up with the Tories to gut your country. I, I don't, I mean, that's not tactical. That's delusional. <laughs> you gotta vote for labor. Yeah. The, yeah they so. have the luxury in the UK of having more parties and they can vote for the party that they actually agree with. Right. Like, what is this Jacobin thing? Oh, just a, I think a fairly relevant yeah. article that just went up on Jacobin. The latest, yeah, you want to go ahead? Yeah, the latest centrist trend in British commentary is to claim to be politically homeless. That's, this is what the New Statesman did. Right. Uh, the concept rests on the fact that they would rarely vote conservative, but dare not vote Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, and all the energy is spent attacking Labour, often about like the anti-Semitism concerns. Right, it's all just, it's all just anti-Labourism, which just means anti-working class policy. That's it. That's it. It's it's not complicated. <laughs> and we're seeing this all over the world. Like we're seeing it here too, obviously. There are plenty, Definitely. plenty of neoliberal centrists who 
will not support would not support Bernie Sanders against Donald Trump. So at the end of the day, does that really make you different from a Republican? I don't think so. The question is, is will this insane neoliberal vote for Bernie Sanders over Donald Trump? Hillary Clinton was on Howard Stern. We're going to do the usual. We'll do the, 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 the trashing that is highly well-deserved here of Hillary Clinton. But I want to actually say before we get into this, uh, she should have done Howard Stern's uh, show in 2016. He begged her for an interview. And if you look at other segments, he facilitates... Uh, her very well and I've been somebody who always as a personality has always liked Hillary Clinton when Hillary Clinton is you know just being well I mean I don't I don't know about just being say Hillary. Benghazi here in Hillary yeah yeah I she's mean, a tough bitch and that's the the absolute and of course it's it's gendered and she was attacked for that for decades there's no doubt about it but I also think on the flip side in 2016 there was something to this obsession with authenticity and Stern could have actually been a vehicle for her to show that part of her personality in a way that's actually like relaxed and relatable. So there's other clips, which I'm not going to play. And, you know, look at the end of the day, go hang out with just Maxwell, go apologize to the people of Haiti and Iraq and all across this country for welfare, for Walmart. Hillary Clinton's absolutely awful, but I do think that there is something to learn here about actual media presence. <laughs> and uh, and Howard Stern's a, a master. I will say a lot of the sort of uh, clap hands emoji that loved this interview, I could only imagine what they would say if Bernie did an interview with Howard. Maybe they would be thinking about Howard in a slightly different way. I mean, I love Howard Stern. He's one of the only people that I actually am, can go back in the archives and I will even be like, sounds a little problematic. Oh, Bernie so, has done interviews with Howard. Well, he did an interview. Yeah, it was, it was there. I mean, that was like in, it was like a six minute, hit on like the FCC in 2004. I mean, like going, I mean, you know, people freaked out about him going on, on uh, Rogan, which was the smart move. I mean, and Rogan, believe me, if you go and listen to the archives, Rogan is actually no Howard Stern. Uh, I, you know, I, but Howard Stern's also like the greatest broadcaster basically of like generations and he's a master interviewer. So all that being said, Hillary Clinton still needs to tell herself the bedtime story that instead of having every single bit of support imaginable and then managing through decades of being a neoliberal who sold out America's underclass and also just having, you know, the strategic acumen of never campaigning in Wisconsin, she needs to blame Bernie Sanders, of course, for losing. Do you mean the Mueller Trump. report? Yeah, the yeah. indictments. Okay. The, the report itself, I think, is also worth reading. But if you read the indictments, you know, basically they were like, hey, let's do everything we can to elect Donald Trump. I mean, that's, those, those are quotes. Those are taken, words. They those said. are words yeah. that taken. And they also said Bernie Sanders. But, you know, that's another for another day. Do we day. hate Bernie Sanders? What? Do we hate Bernie Sanders? No, I don't hate anybody. Bernie could have endorsed you quicker. Uh, he could have. He him. hurt me. There's no doubt about it. He hurt me. But going back to the indictments, because that's right. what's really important. Have you ever spoken to Bernie about that? No. No, you don't I mean, talk to him. I don't talk to him. Yeah, I mean, we did when he finally endorsed me and all that. Wow. But you're upset with him. No, disappointed. Disappointed. Okay. okay. So, and and I hope he doesn't do it again to whoever gets the nomination. Right. Once is enough. We yeah. got. We have to. Yeah, Everyone unite. Are very we have to right join now. forces. Yes. And you know, people could speculate and and have some good reason to speculate about how bad it might be with uh, Trump in the White House. Now we know. There's no guesswork. We know. Right. And and we know that. Given his personality and his 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 rage um, against anyone who, all right, yeah, 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 yada yada yada. All right, guys, can we just start with the? Uh, do we have handy? Let's Bernie Sanders, who toiled for decades to fight for the same people that the Clintons sold out every day of their careers from the 80s and especially through the 90s. I mean, look, I don't want to hear it. I know people still defend it. If you want to talk about welfare reform and look at me in a straight face uh, and, and get indignant about the criticisms, not to mention, I mean, if you know anybody uh, on the ground in Haiti, please spare me. It and was Bernie's, violence. It was racialized violence. Without question. And I do want to get, I should have, I can't believe I didn't top line this disgusting, evil Trump administration uh, attack on people taking food stamps, of which I grew up using. 
Um, and this is of the same line. Welfare reform was the was one of the most uh, large systemic attacks on poor people in American history. Bernie Sanders was fighting against that in the margins. And still, even as he ran against her for president, how many times did he campaign for her? We don't have a total number. Uh, but Bernie Sanders he endorsed her? He was the only the one. He was the only one that went to Michigan and Wisconsin. <laughs> Right, right. Not only will I do over dozen campaign events for you, I'll go and campaign in all the strategically vital states that you think you could skip for Hamptons fundraisers. He flew all over the place and then they tried to gaslight him about how he was flying too much. It's this has been something that the Clinton people have been trying a, a big lie that they've been trying to instill to destroy Bernie Sanders going back to 2017. And it is just a pure lie and the only truth that it speaks to is that they thought they were entitled to not have to run against anybody in a primary anybody at all because frankly yeah. uh they really didn't bernie wasn't really running against hillary in that primary he was running a message campaign if he was running actually against hillary he would have said something like uh, i don't care about your damn emails he right said actually you know what technically uh you know the process there is unclear but her actions do speak to somebody who's maybe um, unafraid to just You would have just said whatever you right. would say when Use you're it. running against somebody for president. He was doing damage control. He for was her. helped her. Exactly. And if and 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 if they still can't understand that he galvanized people, one, because everybody was arrogant and they didn't realize, of course, how actually incredibly effective and strategic Bernie Sanders is a politician, but also because the material conditions in this country are so immiserated that a Jewish socialist senior citizen that you condescended to is going to start eating your lunch in major states. That's on you. And I, and it's, and at this point, I almost even get it because, you know, who wants to look in the mirror and realize that they're majorly responsible for Donald Trump being president. Did and you, that's, and by the way, that, and that's that, you know, yes, Russia, blah, blah, blah. Racism, all of these things are vital. Fa well, racism and sexism are vital factors. Deindustrialization is a vital factor. Russia is a factor, not vital. Did you catch that? But those that three things are shade? vital. But the but the bottom line is, from an electoral point of view, you lost the election. And at another point in the interview, Howard's telling her like, "You got three million votes, more votes than he did. You did your job." No, you didn't. And if you wanted to, and you know what, and, and you're right though, the electoral college of course shouldn't exist. So maybe when Hillary Clinton was on the Walmart board, she could have taken out some of her discretionary income and started campaigning against the electoral college. And then if the Clinton administration did that, or if they voted, or if they pushed for a uh, uh, representation for people in DC and Puerto Rico and Guam, as an example, any, any number of these scenarios, then maybe Hillary Clinton actually winning 3 million more votes would have worked. But because we have an electoral college, it's like watching an endless highlight reel. Great. I'm glad you won that dunk, but you lost the game. And that's on you because you didn't campaign in the fucking Midwest. Sorry. Dead ass. Um, also, I like the epic shade when she said, hope he doesn't do it to whoever gets the nomination this time, as if it couldn't possibly be him. <laughs> I... I am of mixed minds of whether or not we should have, I mean, look, I doubt Hillary Clinton will even endorse Bernie when he's the nominee, but uh, it would be funny. I was talking to Crystal Ball about this. It'd be funny to have her campaign for Bernie, but we certainly wouldn't want to deploy her anywhere significant strategically. Yeah. I don't, I think <laughs> she just needs to go back to the woods and stay there. Indeed. Uh, yeah. That whole family should be ashamed of itself. Like she's not, That's right. I don't see her helping in any, like no <laughs> scenario in which she would help in any way by entering into this particular uh, cycle of politics. No, God, no. Um, all right, let's take another call. You're calling from a 984 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, my name is Daniel from Raleigh, North Carolina. Hey, Daniel, how's it going? Um, good, good. I've been trying to call him for a couple of weeks. Uh, I got a question about a tax plan. Okay. And I want to see what y'all think about it. Okay. Um, so, for information, I work in the field of HVAC. You work in the field I of get, what? Tell I me again. H, uh, HVAC, heating, air conditioning, ventilation. Got it. Okay. Um, I can get up to 60 to 80 hours a week, especially in the summer. Uh-huh. 
So my my kind of plan that I would think would help really trades people out and more middle class is uh, no tax on overtime for people Definitely. making below like a hundred thousand dollars. I totally, or I might even actually up it. Frankly, I agree with you. No tax on overtime. Definitely, yes, hundred yeah, percent. Because um, because right now, I, I and I look at it, I'm like no tax on overtime. All that extra money could be going back into the economy. And I could be catching up bills, working on buying a house, and just moving forward with life instead of just trying to get these small daily bills paid. Yep. No, I think I think you're 100 percent right. And, and, Any, uh, anything else? I, I sent, uh, well, I've sent like uh, emails, try to send one to AOC and Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and I don't know if they you know, have heard about that at all. Uh, hopefully, this gets out to them from. Uh, calling in but i really appreciate y'all taking my call and letting me get this out there. all right have a great day man uh thanks for the call uh all right let's go to an 847 area code who are you where are you calling from it's josh from chicago josh from chicago what's going on josh what's on your mind uh, i want to uh, chime in on the uk election go having ahead. Uh, lived there mm-hmm. um i think there's two things um i just wanted to address the tactical voting mm-hmm. um thing I think, and from some of my friends who have lived there, basically explained this to me. Um, if there is a constituency where the only shot at defeating a Tory is someone who is Lib Dem, mm-hmm. and there are very few of those, mm-hmm. then you should vote because most likely, uh, I mean, the Labor has over 200 seats, and Lib Dem is not going to get anywhere near what it needs to even form a coalition with any like uh, the conservative, well, maybe, I mean, they wouldn't, they're not anywhere near where they would uh, be to get into power. Right. Um, right. But I think the problem also with this is that Lib Dems are standing a candidate in Kensington right now, which uh, labor won um, two years ago. It's a traditional Tory uh, seat and they finally won, uh, won it. And they are basically preventing labor from defending that seat. Um, right. If you look at, uh, right. Well, it's all of these conversations, of course, are always tactical voting for me and not for thee, right? Like, yeah, exactly. That's Um, how it always works. Yeah. And I think that's like the major problem is like there's a lot of Lib Dem candidates that are just refusing to stand down. Right. To even just, even if it's just beating the Tory. Um, But they don't want to beat the Tory. I mean, this is is what's so frustrating about this loser mentality. It's like, look, in an ideal world, you would have a centrist, center-right party that said, we don't want a clown fascist prime minister, and we recognize that the, and there is energy on the left, and we will partner with you, especially since you had essentially adopted our Brexit position. Uh, and therefore, we will enter into an alliance, just like the Brexit party did with the conservatives, and whatever. And then, you know, look, if, if the labor rejected that, then I would disagree with labor, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is that the Lib Dems are crypto Tories who are part of a mass effort to delegitimize the only force of social justice in the United Kingdom. And there's only a handful of seats that this even applies to. And they are also going to make the way for the Tories potentially in other seats. It's a nonsense, nonsense. Yeah. I mean, and I think the, the, the other thing that's, um, I want to point out to people is I actually think Boris Johnson in some cases even though he is a clown fascist, is actually a tougher candidate to defeat, I think, than Theresa May. I definitely. actually think he's a much better campaigner. Yeah, of course he is. And I think yes, I definitely. think he has this sort of weird charisma. Definitely. Maybe in the same way that Trump does. And I think He's um, also anti he's why, also lying about austerity. He's doing the same He is lying about austerity. I, yeah. they, specifically Dominique Cummings, his strategist, fi- said what I, what anybody who knows anything always says. He said two there's video of him a year or two ago saying the electorate socially conservative, economically left. They Agreed they understand left, it. Yeah. They get it. I mean I yes, yeah. it's and, very formidable. Yes. Yeah, so I think he's more formidable than people um give him credit for. I think one thing I want I wanna also, just promote, um, there's a really good uh, candidate in Chingford. She is uh, kind of the AOC that Labor has. Uh, her name is Faiza Shaheen. Mm-hmm. I think I'm pronouncing that right, name mm-hmm. right. Um, if you're there, please go uh, campaign for her. She's taking on um, a, tor- a horrible Tory, Ian Duncan Smith, who's oh. like a horrible yep. brigadier. Yep. He's like one of the worst people on earth. And she's an awesome sort of um, 
I think she has her uh, backbones in sort of Marxist uh, economic theory. And um, she's getting a lot of attention and a lot of steam right now. And it's looking like that's a very tight race. And that could easily flip to labor. And unfortunately, again, the Lib Dems are refusing to stand down and actually promoting Islamophobic um, propaganda against her. Which but what is, about uh, tactical really voting? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I know. All right, Josh, thank you so much. Appreciate the call. Um, all, right. all right, let's do a few more pieces of sound. Joe Biden was just released by John, uh, just endorsed by John Kerry. Uh, Whoa. Blast from the past. Yeah. What did you say? I'm just saying this piece of sound is not in the sheet. Oh, this piece of sound. Okay. I thought we were going to do the ad. All right. What is, I don't know what this sound is. Uh, this is Biden getting into a tussle with a guy who, uh, talks about him about his age and, uh, his son. If we want to talk about it. All right. This is kind of funny. Uh, Joe Biden. Well, first, I want to play an ad that I think will actually be effective in the Democratic primary. This ad, and there was uh, there was some kind of disagreement about the general about how this would play. I'm actually not convinced it wouldn't potentially play well in the general, though I think a lot of people just don't care about this sort of stuff. But what I think it does very effectively is it is it is Trumpian in a smart sense of the word, which is that it's just basically humiliating. Um, this isn't, this is a familiar attack on Trump, but it's not, how dare you, sir? It's, you're a jackass, dude. Joe Biden still leads in the polls. Now we can stipulate, and it is true that basically everything cha changes after Iowa. And so the real question is, is are you in contention in Iowa? And if I, and I feel increasingly positive about Bernie Sanders going to Iowa. Uh, but I increasingly negative about Buttigieg and Biden is still in play. But the thing is, is that I, I think just as if people in certain environments over project their like of Warren onto a broader electorate, which doesn't exist. And I'm talking empirically, she's not particularly popular in Massachusetts. And those of us, you know, have over projected a dislike on Biden. And we all know, I mean, it's, it's not even worth talking about. Everybody knows why Biden's bad. Okay. That's there's, there's not valuable airtime here and going over that. Uh, he's awful. Um, any policy area you could look at. He's but, like a perfect synthesis of Trump and Hillary. <laughs> but, but, uh, if you, I anecdotally and reflected in the polls, there are just this endless day in and day out. Uh, you know, again, it's just the classic thing: people who don't obsess with this stuff. Yeah, I think he's a decent guy, and I think he's the right person to take on Trump. And they're also thinking back to 2016 where, look, Bernie definitely would have beat Trump. And that's the, you know, that's the alternative scenario in which we start to actually maybe save the earth. But, but Joe Biden would have beat Donald Trump in a landslide on pure style, basically. And I think this ad in a Democratic primary I think they've hit a formula for really reinforcing that tendency. And for those of you who, I mean, look, this is about Biden foreign policy. Biden has a awful foreign policy on every corner of earth but set as a style this is effective world leaders caught on camera laughing about president trump several world leaders mocking president trump they're laughing at him my administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country <laughs> didn't expect that reaction but that's okay world leaders mocking and ridiculing him for being completely off balance. Allies are deeply worried about it. They say he's becoming increasingly isolated. Something is very wrong. The world sees Trump for what he is. Insincere, ill-informed, corrupt, dangerously incompetent, and incapable, in my view, of world leadership. And if we give Donald Trump four more years, we'll have a great deal of difficulty if ever being able to recover America's standing in the world and our capacity to bring nations together. Honestly, honestly, for the primary, there is there's definitely some, you know, that that's the 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 second half of it with the violin folks and the PMC crowd and Morning Joe, that's very appealing. In the general, I just drop the second half of it and use the first half. He's a jackass. That's very good humiliation tactic. The other thing I worry about is uh, now that Kerry's endorsed him today. I mean, Kerry ran a similar sort of message against George Bush in 2004, and George Bush won. Absolutely. 
there's a lot of analogies into some type of like degrade world. Carrie Bush is Biden Trump. Uh, now, on the other hand, uh, Joe Biden is too cranky to deal with uh, constituents and protesters. How the hell is he going to deal with Donald Trump? I like calling this guy a protester, too. You'll see him in a second here. Yeah, protesters. <laughs> and he's, he's uh, no backbone. We know that for that. But you, on the other hand, sent your son over there Ooh. to get a job and work for a gas company that he had no experience with gas or nothing <laughs> in order to get access for the to, for the president. So I can see the fire in you're his selling eyes. access to the president just like he was. So you you're a damn liar, man. That's not true. And no one has ever said that. <laughs> no one has that. Made. I no. see it on the TV. You see it on the TV. I do is watch no, it. I know you do. And by the way, that's why I, I'm not sedentary. I don't. I get up and and let me go. Look, the reason I'm running is because I've been around a long time and I know more than most people know. And I can get things done. That's why I'm running. And you want to check my shape on, let's do push-ups together here, man. Let's do, let's run. Let's do whatever you want to do. Let's take an IQ test, okay? Now, I didn't you, say you were doing anything wrong. I you said, said I set up my son to work in an oil company. You know what you said? I get your word straight, Jack. <laughs> I re re here on the on MSNBC. All you know here that in MSNBC. Hey, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. MSNBC okay, helps me, you old fuck. You, well, well, I don't want to either. Well, yeah, you do. But uh, but look, fat, look. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's it, the it looks, deal. It looks like you, you don't have any more backbone than Trump does when you're. you're oh. World star. <laughs> world star. <laughs> to degrade an old white man. <laughs> to discard an old piece of mayo. No, I'm just kidding. I actually like that. You know what? Actually, Instead first of, of all, total props to that guy yeah. because that takes a lot of courage to confront somebody who, you know, with that kind of hostility. I I will also say, be kind of wrong while you do it. And be kind of wrong it. while you do it and then appeal to like one of the least. Yeah. It should not have said sent and don't appeal to MSN. I like how it's like bias. It's like, no, 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 we got totally covered for by MSNBC. I've been, I've been practically incontinent for four months and they're still hyping me. I like Obama <laughs> jumping in being like, instead of his don't boo vote, he's like, don't do push ups, fight. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this probably will, like, I hate to say it. Well, I have an IQ test. We could. <laughs> like, people like this about Joe Biden. They do. He's like a tough guy. No. You know, he that's, seems cool. That's, that this was, that really was stand well. up See, to Trump. That, really that was the other thing that I was going to say that I think, again, I'm sorry. It's just totally missed in these media quarters. I completely can see somebody watching that and being like, guy was insulting his son. Guy was telling him he had no backbone. And yes, that see, it's so dumb. I get it. And I want the Bernie version. I want the we need to actually do something about our world here. And Donald Trump's, you know, just this like just have disdain. Like, oh, like, yeah, whatever. Shut up. Like, we gotta talk about healthcare. But the fact that people did not understand the great 2016 smelling salt olympics did not work <laughs> you know and we're still doing how dare you sir is insane and and frankly it will be embarrassing and humiliating globally and just horrible for the prospects of the human race to watch that campaign unfold but electorally that's a much you go up against trump and instead of like well, well how dare you spread a lie about ukraine sir I will have you know to be like, hey, Jack, <laughs> I might be losing all my mental faculties, but I'll still take you behind the schoolyard. That's better. That's so much better. So I look, I, I, there's a ton of problems about Joe Biden's elect electability, but I, I, I look, I think hopefully he'll just sink in Iowa. But I think people in our circles need to get a lot more, a lot less projective about because even like right there, I look at that and I think he's being a complete asshole and it's embarrassing. But I totally see how people would like that. Just hey, like he's Jamie gonna beat said. Trump up. 
Well, and the problem is... That's a good frame. That guy that challenged him, like, even though he didn't have the specific facts right, like, Biden didn't send his son over, but he just allowed it, right? Yeah, he allowed it. Um, but that guy probably watches a lot more news than most people do, frankly. Definitely. Exactly. I also yep. have to say I was right when I initially disagreed with Sam and some other folks about how Bernie needs to be pulling supporters from Warren in order to win. I think Bernie has a lot more supporters that he could pull from Biden. Um, people's politics, like people's choices of candidate do not usually progress across the political spectrum in a way that makes ideological sense. But that was, well, at least the, the really important part of the argument about Warren and Sanders was inside the circles of people who have influence saying there weren't radical, vast disparities and differences. And that's why that argument needed to be had, because that's completely untrue. And we needed to stop that gaslighting and debunk those myths. Well, that so did. that's that was really, really important. Um, let's he, take like another. We've seen, we've seen it now. Bernie is yeah, well, pulling more support well, that's from what Biden we... than from Warren. But I think we've been no, like no, the, we, the second choice stuff. Yeah. We've been fairly up on like as far as who g goes yeah. to where, like um, like Biden's people go to Bernie. Like that's, yeah, that's been clear. No, we've already said right, that. But that's yeah, been but, clear for yeah, that's been clear from yeah. No one debated that. Everybody the, knew that. But the, the Warren stuff, right? The Warren stuff was about the the circles of the argument of when people were saying there weren't these vital distinctions that needed to be spelled out. That was the point of those conversations. You're calling from a 404 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is CJ from Atlanta. Hey, what's going on, CJ? Hey, yeah, I was uh, really excited to get on with you there, Michael. I had a question, um, kind of going back to how I got started with uh, getting interested in news. I used to watch a lot of Vice on uh -huh. uh, HBO. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they had a lot of really good international coverage, right. but they started covering uh, Juan Waido in a very, like, uh, this guy's awesome. This Juan guy is the, you know, savior of Venezuela. Right. And um, it got me, like, thinking, you know, maybe they're not, you know, looking into the, you know, that they're owned by Disney and the, the yeah, corporate interests by, that they I have. They're owned by Viacom, right? There's some Murdoch money in there, too. Yeah, I mean, Vice is, look, Vice, yeah. I they're like, mostly, I, I, and what? They're mostly owned by a capital group in Texas, which I imagine has a lot of oil holdings, which yeah. I'm just kind of triangulating here, but. I yeah. look into that. It's yeah. like the so, Jake Flores means so TV I, video come to life, literally. Yeah, you should watch that. Uh, d yeah, look, Vice is, it's it's cool that Vice will focus on other types, almost will focus on other types of stories, but their editorial on foreign policy questions is terrible. I uh, I actually work Yeah, and that's, and that's why I stopped watching them to begin with and moved toward uh, like the Michael Brooks show for international news. Um, and lately I've been watching a lot of like a uh, Caspian report on YouTube. Um, but I wanted to get some recommendations from you guys for, uh, you know, besides TMBS, what would be some good sources for international news? Because, you know, I stopped watching Vice about a year ago well, everything and you I've should been take, wanting to fill everything that. Everything you should take with a grain. I mean, this is a realm where there's a huge amount yeah. of bias. So I would try across the board. So I would, I just try to mix it up. So I think Al Jazeera does some great content. They're definitely going to be super biased when it comes to some Gulf and obviously Qatari issues. That's a mm -hmm. big problem, but there's some very high quality reporting there. Um, I think actually the Jacobin does great. Like it, it, there's almost always a really smart left-wing guide by Jacobin for almost any country, usually. Uh, Counterpunch um, is good. Uh, I would look at Venezuela analysis. I'd look at Brazil wire. Um, and then, you know, you just got to mix in. Al Jazeera is a decent baseline in the sense of just even like the geographic range. But I don't like, yeah. I don't like a lot of their reporting on Latin America either, but you can know like what just happened in Sri Lanka, what's happening in elections in you know, in, 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 uh, in Zimbabwe. Right. Um, those are some, yeah. but I'll, I'll keep thinking of more. And Novara Media for news from the UK. And really good analysis. What was that? Novara Media, if you're looking for news and really good leftist analysis out of the UK. Oh, cool. All right. Heck yeah. Well, yeah. It sounds good. Well, yeah, thank you for the recommendations, guys. I, I was listening to uh, or watching Al Jazeera for a while. And, you know, I did some research and saw they were like Qatari State. And I was like, ah. You know, they've got really diverse coverage internationally, but, you know, 
looking into state media of a major oil nation is kind of like, I don't know. But I mean, it's good to know that they have some some uh, credence with you guys as well. But uh, thanks for they taking do. my they call. They have really um, good journalists. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, I don't know who runs the Instagram for Majority Report, but uh, I did a drawing of Sam that I thought was pretty good, and I sent a, a DM to it. So if you want to check it out, I think he might like it. You'll have to talk right. to Sam's robot butler about that. Yeah. I think that's who's running the Ooh. I mean, uh, the BBC is also a state-funded yeah. uh, media organization. It does a lot of good and it does a lot of, a lot of bad. Like, right. That's, that's the nature of media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Basically. And then, yeah. Um, um, but that's that's what I got off the top of my head. I'll think more about that. Thanks so much for the Excellent. call. Well, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. And, yeah, and, and thanks for doing such good international work on your show too, Michael. Oh, much appreciated. Oh, I also like uh, this Bad Empanada channel. Shout out to him. Oh, yeah. We just bad, him on an bad empanada? Recently. Yeah, bad empanada. Thanks, man. All right. Um, I think we will take, we'll do one more piece of sound, one more I am, and one more call. And then we're done. Uh, let's go to sound number three. Impeachment is moving forward. Donald Trump knows he doesn't need to take it seriously. Why? Because he watches television. This is our last opportunity to ask you questions. Do you want to comment on the House Democrats impeachment report that came out last night in the hearing today? Well, I did. I saw it, and it's a joke. Everybody is saying it, and I watched reviews. I watched uh, Hannity, Sean Hannity. I watched uh, Ingram. I watched Tucker Carlson. I watched uh, a lot of other uh, legal scholars, frankly. I watched some people with great legal talent and highly respected, uh, Alan Dershowitz. Uh, and many more, many more. <laughs> wait, wait, pause it. So the first actual lawyer he cites, I don't think, I don't think any of those other people even went to law school <laughs> before they became television anchors, is Alan Dershowitz. All right, yeah. noted. Dollars, <laughs> frankly, I watched some people with great legal talent and highly respected uh, Alan Dershowitz, <laughs> uh, and many more, many more, uh, many more. Many I watched more. a very terrific former. Special prosecutor, you know Ken, and Ken is a talented man and a smart man, and, and I will tell you, uh, it is a, a uniform statement, I think, pretty much, pretty much right down the road, that what they're doing is a very bad thing for our country. It's, it's shocking that all those people agreed. So basically, what I like, I like, I love it though. It's like, it's like, so I went after the impeachment report came out, and I lo I watched the state propaganda network for the full evening, and uh, they all said it was terrible. Someone called about uh, Dave uh, Dave Roth earlier, and he wrote a great piece in the New Republic earlier this year about the feedback loop between Fox News and Trump. In that, like, when policy and all of his agenda platforms went, or you know, were done. He ran out of things to talk about and just talked about Fox News. And they keep feeding each other back and forth. Actually, let's play one more clip here. Because I do think, speaking of the Fox News feedback loop, clip number five. I am not, I am not unsure that we might not hear this from Donald Trump. I, one of the things that's entertained me about this is that basically like Devin Nunez is like directly involved in this apparently. <laughs> and... You know, apparently he's called Rudy Giuliani. And that does not look great. And some people on Fox, their job is to tell the big lie. But there's also the micro lies and interesting hypotheticals. And Greg Jarrett has one, which is, what if Devin Nunez wasn't making the calls from his phone himself? In other words, what if we're in some type of Nancy Pelosi Ocean's Eleven scenario? What if it was the cow? <laughs> the only thing new that I picked out of yesterday's was this uh, <laughs> communication between Devin Nunes, Rudy Giuliani, and the White House. Uh, in what way, if any, is that problematic? Well, we just don't know because we don't know the details. In fact, it's a call <laughs> log. Does that mean that Devin Nunes was actually on the call or somebody else? Uh, and we don't know the import of it. Um, you know, I frankly, I don't trust Adam Schiff. He has a long and distinguished track record <laughs> of deception and lies. And I lay it out in my book. He lied about uh, the dossier. He lied about Bruce Orr. He lied about evidence of collusion. And of course, we saw him lie at the beginning, the first hearing into impeachment and in which he made up a narrative that didn't exist. Uh, is, is this the dude who... Okay. All right. I'll just say this. 
Greg Jarrett Airport, but it could be a body double. <laughs> so wait, wait. Um, do we remember? Yes. I don't know when uh, we had the whole uh, discussion about government spying and collection of metadata. Yes. When we found out how much you can actually learn from metadata, but like, I, th- th- this just seems, r- I don't know. What we can learn is that Barack Obama in a loose affiliation with George Soros gave Nancy Pelosi the order to tell Adam Schiff to steal Devin Nunez's cell phone. That's why Rudy Giuliani was standing in Kiev like, who's this? Who's this? I thought Evan... <laughs> Devin's supposed to be calling me. Why is there no... By the way, why why if they called him and it wasn't Devin, didn't they have somebody fake? Like, you should have had a Devin Nunez impersonator. Like hey, somebody why didn't who, Giuliani report a weird phone yeah, call why from Devin Nunez? Yeah, why... There's this guy who sounds really irritated and stupid, which sounds like Devin, who keeps calling me. But I don't think it's him. That's pretty awesome. As always with all Republican and Fox News conspiracy theories, I could only wish that the Democratic Party yeah. was remotely as cool as they projected out. All right, final I am of the day. Water boat from Kashmir. Four months of blackout in Kashmir, the most militarized place in the world. I want to mention the horrors, past, present, and current pending. BuzzFeed has an article on how Kashmiris just got started dropping out of WhatsApp this week. Four months of inactivity. This is modern ethnic cleansing if, it, if, it, if well planned. I will be returning to it. There's a really good piece in the New Yorker, actually, that just came out on on Modi. Um, Okay, final call of the day. Let's see. Let's see here. You're calling from a 516 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's me. Yep, it's you. Hey, this is James from New York. Hey, James. Um, I just... Hey. I just had a quick comment, um, just a reminder to anybody who supports Bernie Sanders that you can uh, make calls for him. Uh, you can just do it from home. You just need a computer or a tablet and a phone. And uh, there's a really well-designed system. Um, basically just routes your call to, once somebody says hi, you start talking and re- really good uh, process. And you can do it if you're international and uh, if English isn't your first language. Thank you. I've talked to a lot of people, including people who say like they're, you know, very shy and it's something they haven't done before. And like they love doing it. Making calls for Bernie is super easy. And uh, and it, that really matters. I mean, the whole, you know, again, yeah. the whole apparatus is biased against them. You have to counteract it with like actual organizing. So doing those things like making calls for Bernie or could not be more important right now. James, thanks for the call. All right, folks, sorry, no more time for any more calls. We're going to uh, hang up the phone and of course, leave it on. I'm just kidding. Turn, uh, turn the uh, voicemail on and uh, that's it. Okay. And we will, read one more I am before we sign off. Let me see. Matt from Mass with the final I am of the day. Bernie hurt Hillary by being a better candidate than she ever could. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Take a strength I got to get to where I want but I know I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive